here we are on part two of our lecture relating to chemistry. We're moving on to the bonds that form between atoms. And when two or more atoms get together to form a bond, they form what's called a molecule. So let's take a look at, there we go, um, some of the things that we need to discuss related to molecules. And the first thing is we need to know that, again, when two or more atoms share electrons, we have a molecule. And molecules are the smallest form of a compound. So go back and think of our previous lecture. I said atoms were the smallest components of a element. And molecules are the smallest portions of a compound. Now sometimes you can get what are called diatomic molecules, which di means two, atomic means atom. Diatomic molecules, for example, two hydrogen atoms bonded together is a diatomic molecule. Two atoms of oxygen bonded together is another example of a diatomic molecule. You can get a lot more complex molecules, such as this carbon here, which is bonded to four separate hydrogen atoms. Um, and we're going to talk about exactly uh, what the different types of bonds are. But before we do that, really quickly, I want to show you something here. And you'll want to study this in your book as well. This picture here shows several ways that we can represent a molecule. One option is to represent it using those Bohr diagrams we talked about that show you where the electrons are in the energy shells. That's one option. That's this electron model here. Another way we can represent a molecule is by writing the symbol for the atom, a dash representing a bond, and then the other atom is bonded to. Okay, So there's a hydrogen diatomic molecule. That's called a structural formula. And then the last one, the molecular formula, we could just simplify this. Instead of writing H dash H, we could just write H with a number 2 below, signifying two hydrogen atoms bonded together. Let's take the example of methane down here. This one is a carbon with four, uh, four hydrogens bonded to it. And you can see the first option, the electron model, shows the carbon in the middle with four hydrogens bonded around the outside to make a total of eight electrons in the outermost energy shell. Uh, we can write that as a structural formula with the carbon and a straight line representing each uh, bond to each hydrogen. Or we can simplify it even further and just write C, H, and then the small number four below the hydrogen. That represents or means that there are four hydrogens and one carbon all bonded together to make a molecule of methane. Two other types of models you'll hear talked about sometimes are the ball and stick model. This is where you use um, little balls and tiny sticks, and you can actually uh, make your own three-dimensional models of atoms. Uh, and then there's this thing called the space filling model, which is more uh, of a realistic representation of where the electrons are orbiting around the nucleus of an atom in the space that these take up. Now, on the next couple of slides, we're going to be talking about the different types of bonds that can form between two atoms. Uh, we're going to start out with ionic bonds, and then we'll move on later to talk about covalent bonds. And we're going to find out that there are a couple different types of covalent bonds called polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is not actually a true type of bond, um, but something similar, and that's called a hydrogen bond. So let's go ahead and start off here talking about an ionic bond. Uh, ionic bonds are interesting because in ionic bonds, one atom actually donates or gives up completely one of its electrons and gives it to the other atom. So let's take the most common example of an ionic bond. Let's take table salt, the kind of salt you shake on your French fries. Table salt is sodium chloride, capital N, small a, for sodium, capital C, small l, for chloride. Sodium chloride is table salt. This is a, an example of ionic bond. If we look at sodium, sodium has in its outermost energy shell a single little electron right there. By comparison, chlorine in its outermost uh, energy shell has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons. 
Now, if we go back and remember the octet rule, you remember that an energy, an energy shell is happiest when it has eight electrons. So for chlorine here, in order to get to a point where it's stable, it needs one more electron. For sodium over here, sodium has a couple options. One option is it could somehow try to find a way to gather up seven electrons from somewhere else and fill up its outermost energy shell. That would be kind of a tough feat. Okay. On the other hand, it would be really easy for uh, sodium to simply instead just give up its one electron to somebody else and then notice that the next energy shell down is already filled with a total of eight. So then it would be stable. So for sodium, it's very easy for it to give up its one electron and chlorine takes that one electron and both are happy. Now both have energy, outermost energy shells that have a total of eight electrons. So again, when one atom completely donates an electron, gives its electron away to another atom, that forms an ionic bond. Now you will notice here with sodium, remember I told you that always in, a, in the unbonded atom, you will have the exact same number of protons and electrons so that they balance each other out and you have a zero net charge. If this sodium atom gives up one of its negatively charged electrons, well it still has all of its positively charged protons in the middle. So overall, it's now going to have one more positively charged proton than it does negatively charged electrons to balance it out. And so overall, sodium, after it gives away its one electron, is now going to have a one positive charge. Chlorine, on the other hand, has just taken on an extra electron, but it didn't take on any extra protons. So it has one more electron than it would in its natural state. Therefore, overall, it now has a one negative charge. And here you can see how we've represented that down here. We've got a positive sign on the sodium here showing that it's short one electron. We have a negative sign here on the chlorine, um, the chloride ion showing that it has gained an extra electron. Okay. Now what causes them to bond or form and tra uh, to, to bond with each other, the ionic bond part, is simply that the positive charge of the sodium is attracted to the negative charge of the chlorine and they will hang out in proximity to each other because opposite charges attract each other. Okay, so that's an ionic bond. Now let's compare that to what's called a covalent bond. In a covalent bond, two or more atoms share electrons. They don't give them up and one takes the electron and the other loses it. Instead, they share electrons. And this is a far more common scenario that we see. Um, now let's take a look here. If we had two hydrogen uh, atoms, as you see here, hydrogen has one proton, and then it has one electron orbiting around it. And if we take another hydrogen atom, here's its one proton, here's its one electron orbiting around it. Um, remember in the first energy shell you can have only a total of two electrons. So each of these atoms here just needs one more electron and it will have a full energy shell and be stable. Well an easy way to do that is for these two to simply share their electron with each other so that they have a filled energy shell in essence. Okay? That's called a single covalent bond. Now, if we shared four electrons, if each atom had two, so let's take uh, oxygen here. In oxygen, we've got in the outermost energy shell, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six in the outermost energy shell. And uh, the other molecule of oxygen had one, two, three, four, five, six in its outermost energy shell. Each oxygen needs two more electrons to have a full eight. So we could share electrons here, and we could share electrons here, and now we have two co covalent bonds between the oxygens for a double, okay, double covalent bond. Wow, that's not the color I wanted my highlighter, but you get the idea here, a double covalent bond.
Okay. If we write it as a structural formula, we would write that as O dash dash O for two bonds. A triple bond uh, like nitrogen can form a triple bond with itself would be written as three lines, and that means you're sharing a total of six electrons. Okay, double bond is sharing a total of four electrons. Single bond is sharing a total of two electrons. Now, there are two types of covalent bonds. Okay, remember I said a covalent bond is when two or more atoms share electrons. Now, sharing can happen in one of two ways. You can have equal sharing, or you can have unequal sharing. If I have equal sharing, I form what's called a nonpolar molecule. And let me give you an example here with methane. Um, you can see here methane is sharing an electron with this hydrogen. Uh, carbon is sharing an uh, electron with this hydrogen. Carbon is sharing an electron with this hydrogen. Carbon is sharing an electron with this hydrogen. And carbon is sharing an electron with this hydrogen. And because um, there's equal pull on the electrons in all four directions, the hydrogen going this way is pulling equally on the electrons. This way, the hydrogen is pulling equally on the electrons. There's the pulling on the electrons is equal in all directions. The end result is this is like a four-way tug of war where everybody's pulling with the same amount of strength. And as a result, the electrons are very nicely, evenly spaced out between the atoms. And as a result, we get something called nonpolar. Polar means charged. So this is a non-charged molecule. Now, on the other hand, uh, water doesn't have this nice equal sharing of electrons. Instead, it has very unequal sharing of its electrons. So its covalent bonds are called polar covalent bonds. So let me show you an example of this with water. Um, in water, water is made of two hydrogen and one oxygen all bonded together. So we have an oxygen. It has two electrons on its innermost energy shell, and then it has one, two, three, four, five, six electrons in its outermost energy shell. And hydrogen has um, just one electron. So here in this instance, we could have a covalent bond form between this hydrogen electron and this oxygen electron. And we can have a similar covalent bond form here between this hydrogen electron and this, and this uh, oxygen electron, OK? So H2O. Now, where does the unequal sharing come in? Well, the unequal sharing comes in because oxygen here in the center is kind of an electron hog. It has a very strong ability to pull electrons close to it. And it literally pulls those electrons away from hydrogen and closer in to its nucleus. And so what happens is this is almost like an kind of almost like an atomic uh, an ionic bond in the sense that since the electrons are so much closer to the oxygen and so far away from the hydrogen, this oxygen kind of behaves like it has a negative charge. And in fact, we use the delta symbol from Greek with a little negative sign. The delta means partial, and the negative means negative. So this is a partial negatively charged oxygen atom, OK? Partial negative charge. At the same time, if we look at this hydrogen over here, it still has its one proton in the center, but its electron has been pulled way far away from it. So in essence, it has a partial positive charge. And the same thing is true with this hydrogen down here. Its electron is so far away from it, it has a partial positive charge to it. Notice this is unequal sharing. The oxygen is kind of hogging the electrons. Yeah, they're sharing the electrons, but this is like if you and your brother sit down to share um, uh, blueberry pie together, and your brother gets six slices and you only get two, well, yeah, you shared the pie, but you're, it was not equal sharing, right? Your brother got more than you did. So this is an example, again, of um, unequal sharing. This is called a polar, meaning charged, covalent bond. All right. Now, because I've got partial positive and negative charges, this makes for some very interesting scenarios with water molecules. When I get, I'm going to represent um, 
an, another molecule of water here this way, okay? And we've got a partial negative charge here and a partial positive charge here and here. And let's uh, draw another molecule of water nearby, because water molecules tend to hang out together, like in a glass of water. And you've got partial positive charges here and partial negative charge by the oxygen. Now what you'll notice here is that there's a partial positive charge next to this hydrogen. There's a partial negative charge next to this oxygen. Those partial positive and negative charges are attracted to each other. And the end result is we get an attraction between the two. They want to hang out near each other. And as a result, this hanging out near each other isn't a true bond because there is no sharing of electrons, but it is a type of bond called a hydrogen bond. Oops. A hydrogen bond. Okay, so a hydrogen bond is not a true bond because there is no sharing of electrons. However, it is a type of bond in the sense that it holds two molecules uh, close to each other because of these uh, attraction between the partial positive and negative charges of the polar covalent molecules. Now a water molecule can have hydrogen bonds with up to six other uh, water molecules surrounding it. So you can draw a pretty complex arrangement here of hydrogens attracted to oxygens, and et cetera, between different molecules. Um, it turns out that these hydrogen bonds that form in water are absolutely critical for why water behaves the way it does in many scenarios. And that's going to be the topic of our next part of this lecture where we look at the properties of water. See you there.